want to welcome you to worship this morning. Today is the fourth Sunday of Advent. The candle that was lit represents love. Please join me in our Advent litany. I will read the leader part and you will follow with the part marked with the letter C for the congregation. In a world divided and hurting, In a world of lost and lonely people. Jesus brings true light to the world. God promises in his word that he loves us and his world. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. Jesus, we trust in you and believe the promises of your word. May your kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven. Please stand as we sing, O come, all ye faithful.
greets us this morning with words from Luke chapter 2. And there were shepherds living out in the fields nearby, keeping watch over their flocks at night. An angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid. I bring you good news that will cause great joy for all the people. Today in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is the Messiah, the Lord. Just as the angel greeted the shepherds with an announcement that the long-awaited Messiah had been born, please greet and welcome those around you this morning. is 
born today. Repairing room, repairing room. Let the King of Glory enter in. God with us, the promise has come to me. Prophets were longing to see In the darkness of blazing lights To the hungry the words of life His kingdom now is near For those with ears to hear confession. Lord, we often fail to prepare room for you. We fill our lives with so many things and leave no room for you. Father, please forgive us. Cleanse us from anything that keeps us from opening up our hearts to your cleansing and your forgiveness. In your precious name we pray. Amen. bring peace to be loved to be nearer to us and you've come to bring life to be light to shine brighter and us oh Emmanuel God with us our dealing Savior, in your presence we find our strength over everything, our redemption, God with us, you are God with us, oh, you've come to be whole. Conquer the grave, O oh, Emmanuel. God with us, our deliverer, you are Savior. In your presence, 
God's people said, amen. You may be seated at this time. This is a number of announcements to share with you as we join together in prayer. I got quite a few of them, actually. So our Christmas Eve service, there's two of them, one at five and one at seven. They are identical candlelight services, and so we will celebrate together the birth of our Savior uh, on Christmas Eve this Thursday evening. Also want to draw attention to the small group Bible study that Cool Plug and Cool is beginning on Sunday evenings after the new year entitled Crazy Busy. It's a great study. I think it's five or six weeks, comes with a book, and just enables us to probe together uh, how our busyness impacts our faith life and our relationship to the Lord Jesus Christ in all that we do. If you're interested, please contact Cole, and uh, he would love to get you plugged in. Quite a few people announcements. Uh, The first one is Daryl Alfords did return home from the hospital on Friday evening. He's being treated with meds right now for his pain until they discern uh, the next uh, course of action. You probably also read on the prayer happenings that Al DeWitt suffered a stroke. He is currently in the Sioux Center Hospital, and the family is requesting prayers for clarity, not only for treatment, but for placement, and uh, since he can't stay in the hospital there too long. You read in the newsletter and also in the prayer happenings uh, or in the worship folder that Don Bonham's mother, Mary Ann Hawk, passed away. That visitation is today from 3 to 5 p.m. at the Memorial Funeral Home in Sioux Center, and the funeral service will be held uh, tomorrow morning at 10.30 a.m. at the Bethel Christian Reformed Church. They asked me to share with you that the burial will be private, there will be no lunch, and masks will be required both at the visitation and and at the service. We want to lift up prayers for Lane and Edie Bonhama. Lane's mother, Marjorie Bonhama from Granville, Michigan, passed away. She was 98 years old. She passed away early yesterday morning. Due to COVID and the way the family uh, is spaced out these days, uh, there will be a private uh, graveside service in Prinsburg, Minnesota this week, and then there will be a full memorial service uh, this summer when the family is able to come together. And then Jared S. Heiss, we want to remember him and his family in our prayers. His grandson, Bennett Canaan Vanderwind, was born on December 3, just 16, 17 days ago. Bennett passed away early this morning. Uh, In Jared's communication to me, of course, many of you know this was expected. And, uh, but as he said in the communication, the Lord has given us 16 days of grace with him and they are grateful for that. At the same time, it's sad, and we want to remember the family in our prayers. Let's go before our God and King, who loves and delights to listen to his children.
Father in heaven, we thank you and praise you for the privilege to be here this morning. You are God with us, and you are the God who is for us. And by the power of your Spirit, you are the God who is in us, drawing us ever back to that fountain of grace revealed in Jesus Christ, your Son and our Savior. And this morning, we thank you, we praise you, we worship, we adore you for that gospel message. And Father, we pray that that good news of Jesus in this Advent season will go out to every child, woman, and man from every tribe and nation and language, and that every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Father, we look to the past, and we look to the first advent of Jesus coming as a child, living our life, bearing our suffering, our shame, and dying our death so that today, by the power of your Spirit, we can say we are children of the living God. And we look forward to the future when Christ will come again, and there will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain. And we look forward to the day when everything will be made brand new. And Father, we pray that in this Advent season, that gospel of all that you have accomplished and all that you will bring, will bring life and joy and hope into this world. Father, we lift up this congregation and we have talked about many different names, those who have faced surgery and have returned home, those who have suffered with COVID and are now doing better, those who have passed away, both young and old, And Father, it reminds us that no matter our age, no matter our circumstance, we are vulnerable people. And we recognize that life is short. And we recognize that at the end of the day, this world has nothing to offer us to bring life and hope or anything eternal. And so in this Advent season, help us to fix our eyes on your Advent Son who has come and is coming to thank him for the life that he has achieved, and to look forward to the day when we will see his beauty face to face. And Father, for all of these families and for all of us here, we pray that because of the gospel, we will be thankful when things go well, patient when things go against us, but always most certain that nothing can separate us from your love. Because in Advent, we learn that you are the God who is for us. You are the God who is with us. and You are the God who is in us by your Holy Spirit. We pray that you'll be with us as we give our gifts. We thank you for the privilege to simply give back what you have first provided to us. And that in it, we symbolize that our whole life is an offering of gratitude to you. And we thank you for the privilege to listen to your word. We ask that you will speak to us, that our ears and hearts and eyes and minds will be attentive to the voice of your Spirit. Thank you for this beautiful day. Continue to lead and guide us in your grace. In the good and beautiful name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Our offering is for tuition assistance this morning. and There's many different ways that we can give, and they are listed on the screen And at the same time, you may want to take your church center app out and perhaps fill out the connection card and let us know who you are if you are visiting with us. At least we would like to know who you are. And that is a good way for us to get to know you. While you're thinking of those two things, and as we prepare to hear God's word from Psalm 130, we will sing the song, Peace Has Come. So let's stand up and sing it together. Sink. 
I invite you to take out your Bibles or your smartphones or just look on the screen to Psalm 130. And we will continue our Advent series based on the Psalms of Ascent. Today, Psalm 130. We've looked at Psalm 120, 121, 126, and today, 130, under the theme Advent Mercy. And this is God's word. Out of the depths I cry to you, Lord. Lord, hear my voice. Let your ears be attentive to my cry for mercy. If you, Lord, kept a record of sins, Lord, who could stand? But with you there is forgiveness, so that we can, with reverence, serve you. I wait for the Lord, my whole being waits. And in his word I put my hope. I wait for the Lord more than watchmen wait for the morning, more than watchmen wait for the morning. Israel, put your hope in the Lord, for with the Lord is unfailing love, and with him is full redemption. He himself will redeem Israel from all their sins. Friends in Jesus Christ, forgiveness is the daily hunger of the human soul. Or at least the assurance of forgiveness is the daily hunger of my heart and your heart. And any time we come to this gospel that offers the unfailing love and forgiveness of God, 
we are touching the nerve of what it means to be a Christian. Maybe to get at the heart and soul of this message, I can share a story that I've shared with you in the past, but it's worth sharing again because it gets to the point. It's a Spanish story about a father and a son who became estranged. The son ran away, the father set off to find him. And this father searches for months and months and months, but with no success. Finally, in a last desperate effort, the father put an ad in the Madrid newspaper. And here's what the ad said. Dear Paco, meet me in front of this newspaper office at noon on Saturday. All is forgiven. I love you, your father. On that Saturday at 12 noon, 800 Pacos showed up looking for forgiveness and love from their fathers. It's a story, but it points to something true, that there is this universal hunger for forgiveness and for assurance. With it we live, without it we shrivel up and we die. In Psalm 130, we meet what is called one of the penitential psalms. The lament of a psalmist about his own personal sin and the lamentable choices he has made. But as he talks about sin and as he talks about this difficulty in our life, he takes us from the abyss of depression that is the fruit of sin and he moves toward the heights of assurance that is the fruit of God's gracious and unfailing love. And what Advent intends to show us is that Jesus just didn't come to be a cute little baby in a manger about whom we can sing lovely songs. He came to die because of sin. And he came to die for that sin because of God's unfailing love. Martin Luther, the great reformer, called this the Pauline Psalm. Not only because it showed the greatness of salvation by grace alone, but because in it he shows the desire of God's heart to pour his grace ever generously into human lives. John Wesley the great theologian, pastor, revivalist in the Church of England, it was this psalm, Psalm 130, that led to his conversion in Jesus Christ as the Lord of his life in 1738 in St. Paul's Cathedral in London. And when I think of the words of this psalmist, their impact on Martin Luther, and what it did to John Wesley, I wonder what these words mean for us. When I read these words, did it stir anything in the depths of your heart? When we read these words, did it stir within you a holy awareness of your sin? When we read these words, did it stir any sense of the presence of God and that he just might? perhaps keep a record of sins and what that means? Or when we read these words, did it stir a holy awareness of the pervasiveness and the bigness of God's generous forgiveness and unfailing love for broken, sinful people like me and you? See, Psalm 130 is not information that we just take and register in some theological library somewhere. Psalm 130 is the voice of the Spirit to penetrate the resistance of our proud hearts and to say there is forgiveness. And we don't have to hide like Adam and Eve, but we can be filled with a generous grace and a generous love that is beyond our wildest imaginations. And when we come to Advent, 
looking back to the first arrival of Jesus, anticipating his second arrival, it calls for our repentance and our confession. In fact, in the spirit of this series, it's one thing to be fed up with all the sin and the evil that marks our world. But it's another thing to be fed up with the sin that is at work in my own life. We're in the spirit of Psalm 121. It's one thing to look to the hills and see all of the dangers and evils that are caused by human sin. It's quite another thing to look into my own heart and to see the rugged terrain of the hills and the valleys caused by my own lamentable sin. We're in the spirit of Psalm 126. It's one thing to say God is bringing joy through Jesus into this sad world. But it's quite another thing to say that the way I receive that joy is through repentance and confession. Psalm 130 invites us from the abyss of sin into the heights of grace through the great gift of repentance and confession. The Apostle Paul picks up on this. In 2 Corinthians 6, he quotes Isaiah 49, and he says this, he says, Do not receive God's work in vain. For God says, In the time of my favor I heard you, and in the day of salvation I helped you. I tell you, now is the time of God's favor. Today is the day of salvation. Today, right now, for me, for you, for us. What we know from Scripture is this. That with repentance and confession, there is forgiveness. Without it, there isn't. And with repentance and confession, there is healing. But without it, there isn't. It's that radical, this grace, this generous grace that God brings into our lives. So let's turn to Psalm 130 and discover for ourselves this Advent mercy. And this psalm can be broken into four stanzas that paint a beautiful picture. It begins in the abyss of depression that is the fruit of sin and ends in the heights of grace that is the assurance of forgiveness, the offer of forgiveness to all who desire it. And so we look at stanza one, it's verses one and two, the cry for mercy. Out of the depths I cry to you, Lord. Lord, hear my voice. Let your ears be attentive to my cry for mercy. There's two key words in there. Depths and cry. And when you go to the Old Testament and you hear that word depths, in every other instance it's used, it means this, that my life is caught in the dangerous, deep, dark waters of a raging storm on the ocean. I'm drowning. There's nowhere to plant my feet. I'm gasping for air and there is no one and there is nothing that can help me. And so I'm desperate because I've been separated from God in my sin and that's my condition and that's your condition. But then comes the cry. The cry out of the depths I cried to you, Lord. Hear my voice. Be attentive to my cry for mercy. Martin Luther says the depths and the cry should awaken two things within us. On the one hand, it should awaken a sense of self-awareness. He says these words. These are noble, passionate, and very profound words of a truly penitent heart that is most deeply moved in its distress because of sin. In fact, this cannot be understood except by those who have felt and experienced it. We are all deep and great. We are all in deep and great misery, but we do not all feel our condition. And Luther is begging the question, 
Are we self-aware to know that our sin is deeper and more pervasive than we either experience or are willing to admit? Do we know that? And are we willing to confess that? But then he says a second thing. Do you know, he says, that the very fact that the psalmist talks about depths and cry is pointing the finger at the character of God. That even though we have this pride that stands in the way of our ability to confess that we're drowning in our own lamentable behavior, God is patient and waiting to hear from us. And He delights to hear the cries of anyone in any circumstance at any time. The cry for deliverance and rescue and forgiveness. And so says Luther, when you come to these words, even in the depths of the abyss of depression that is the fruit of sin, we see the glimmers of an amazing grace of a God who does not want us to drown. And that leads to the second stanza, verses 3 and 4. If the first is the cry for mercy, the second one is the gift of mercy. And so writes the psalmist, If you, Lord, kept a record of sins, Lord, who could stand? But with you there is forgiveness so that we can with reverence serve you. Who keeps a record of sin? We all do, right? I look at you, you look at me, and you look at your neighbor, and you know all the misgivings, you know all the mistakes, and we keep the record, and we hold it against them. At the other two services, when I asked this question, does your spouse keep a record of your misgivings? There were lots of smiles. Do our children keep a record of our parental failures? Mine certainly do. Does your coworker, do they keep a record of your failures? Does your employer keep a record of your insubordination? Your neighbor, how annoying you really are? Your teacher or anyone else? And do we stand a chance? And now, says the psalmist, if that's true on the human level, what about God? What if God kept a record of sins? Knowing that my one offense against Him is greater and more debilitating of life and more defaming of God than all of the host of misgivings against me. But Jeremiah already made the point that God remembers our sin no more. And so you get to verse 4 and it says, but with you there is forgiveness so that we can with reverence serve you. Every commentator agrees that verse 4 is a reference back to Exodus 34, 6 and 7 when the tabernacle is dedicated. And God reminds Israel of, their char- of His character toward them. The Lord, the Lord, the compassionate and gracious God is slow to anger, abounding in love and faithful and maintaining love to thousands and forgiving wickedness, rebellion and sin. These words are just pregnant with grace. Pregnant with unfailing love. They're inclusive. They're not for a select class of people. They're for anyone and everyone in every situation, any circumstance, whatever. God delights to forgive. And His forgiveness right now, even though the text says, but with you there is forgiveness, the actual reading is, with you, comma, forgiveness. Meaning, right now, immediately, on the spot. And it's for anyone who desires it, who comes before Him in repentance and faith. And it's for the best of our lives. So that with reverence and awe, we can serve Him. We can stand. We can walk. We can live. We can breathe. We can be His ambassadors in the world. And in stanza two, the gift of mercy is simply this. God is the God who says, I have come to you even though you don't come to me because I'm the God who doesn't want you to drown. I'm going to restore you to life. You're mine. The gift.
gift of mercy to anyone who cries out. And then in that gift, the, the third stanza says we can embrace that mercy in verses 5 and 6. I wait for the Lord, my whole being waits, and in His Word I put my hope. I wait for the Lord more than watchmen wait for the morning, more than watchmen wait for the morning. And the key word is wait. But what is he waiting for? Deliverance from sin? Nope. He already has that in verses 3 and 4. Deliverance from harsh times? Well, maybe, but that's not the focus here. The focus is sin. So what's he waiting for? He's waiting for God himself. It's one thing to say, I'm forgiven. It's one thing to have that assurance. But to see the face of the forgiver, to see the face of the unfailing love, that's everything, says the psalmist. You see, the watchman in the morning, the watchman was the one who stood guard over Israel at night. They looked around the horizon of the darkness of all the dangers that are out there and would sound the trumpet blast when there would be danger on the horizon. And what they always looked for was the morning, the daylight, because that's when it was the safest. And what the psalmist is ultimately saying is, as a watchman waits for the morning, we are waiting for the morning sun of the face of God to shine upon us. And we will know the full beauty of His forgiveness. Not because we feel it, because we see the beauty of His face. Isn't that great? Martin Luther captured this beautifully. Martin Luther said this based on verses 5 and 6. He says, don't be merciful to yourself. Because what will happen when you're merciful to yourself is something like this. Oh, I can forgive myself for that. Huh. I'll just go on. And the more I do that to myself, the less I need the face of Jesus. But he says, keep your heart open, lamenting in repentance and confession your sin, and yearn for the face of Jesus. Because if you are just going to forgive yourself, Jesus will never be good enough because he will never give you what you think you want. But if you depend upon Jesus, you're going to look for that face and you're going to be flooded with a love that is beyond your wildest imaginations. Embrace Him. Wait for Him. You are more sinful than you ever dared to believe and more loved by Him than you ever dared to imagine. And that leads this psalmist to the final stanza. If the first one is the cry for mercy, the second the gift for mercy, and the last one embracing his mercy, finally in verses 7 and 8, we see the God of all mercy. Israel, put your hope in the Lord, for with the Lord is unfailing love, and with him is full redemption. He himself will redeem Israel from all their sins. Do you notice what's happening here? This psalmist looks within his own heart he cries out, he receives, he embraces. And he knows that what has been given to him in the unfailing love and mercy and forgiveness of God is not just for him alone, it's for anyone and everyone, every child, woman, and man from every tribe and nation and language. And so he says, O oh, Israel, put your hope in God. He moves from himself to the world. Who's Israel? In the Bible, Israel is anyone, any person who comes in repentance and confession before the Lord. And they will receive His unfailing love. And they will receive His eternal grace. This psalm takes us from the abyss of depression that is the fruit of sin and it takes us step by step to the heights of grace for anyone who wants to receive forgiveness, anyone who wants that assurance through the beautiful gift 
of repentance and confession. But let me ask you a question. Where is that unfailing love ultimately revealed? Where is full redemption finally to be found? And what does it mean that He Himself will redeem Israel from all of their sins? Well, maybe to answer that question, let me tell you a stupid story. It's about me. When I was a kid, in the backyard, always practicing my golf shot with little plastic balls. But felt particularly confident because I was going to swing just my sand wedge, little plop shots here and there, you know, drop shots. Wasn't harmful to anyone. And so tonight was the night to use a real golf ball. I had the perfect swing, the perfect shot. Even TV commentators would have been impressed. And there went the ball, a little further than I anticipated. It wasn't good for me, and it wasn't good for the window. And it's an interesting study in human nature. But as my father's holding the golf ball, I am lying profusely saying it wasn't me even though I'm holding the golf club. And he patiently just prodded me, and he patiently led me to repentance and confession. Then he forgave me. And then the best of all worlds, he paid for the window. And that's a big deal in the gospel. Because we have to ask the question, who pays for sin? Who bears the cost? Because according to Paul in Romans 6, the wages of sin is death. There's pain and there's a cost. And who bears the pain and who pays it? And you know how it is between people, right? I am not going to forgive that person until they come to full confession, until they come to full repentance, and they meet the standards that give me satisfaction. How does that go? The repentance will never be good enough. The confession never thorough enough. It will never be good enough. And I will likely not forgive. When you come to the Gospel and you ask the question, who pays and who bears the pain? The answer is God Himself. God made Him who had no sin to be sin for us so that in Him we might become the righteousness of God. For Christ died for sins once for all, the righteous for the unrighteous, to bring you to God. Ask yourself this question. Who is the most sinful person to have ever walked the face of the earth? It's not me. And it's not you. It is Jesus. The perfect Son of Man is the most sinful person to walk the face of the earth. Because what the Gospel is saying is this. That God plucks His hand into our heart and our lives. To every child, every woman, every man, every tribe, every nation, every language, past, present, future. And He puts it all in Jesus. He takes the beauty and the majesty and the righteousness and the goodness of Jesus and He places it in us. I just have to bear my sin. You just have to bear yours. Jesus bears the sin of every single human being, past, present, future. He bears the pain. He pays the cost. He is born to die so that in our death we will receive the gift of life. That's the unfailing love. That's a God who is so committed to us to take us from the abyss of depression as we drown in the midst of our sin and says, you don't have to be there. You don't have to be there at all. 
Because in my Son, I've come to rescue you and to take you to the heights of my forgiveness and my assurance. And so then I wonder, what do these words of Psalm 130 mean to you? Can they stir an awareness of sin that I am free to take and plop at God's throne where He says, thank you? Do I have an awareness, an overwhelming awareness that He's not keeping a record of my sin? Praise the Lord, eh? And Do I have this overwhelming sense that God's grace is so much bigger and so much wider and so much deeper and so much more abundant than all the sin combined of the human race? And that He's just ready that when we confess and repent, to flood our lives with an undying, relentless mercy for each of us. That's what these words mean. And so Paul, better yet, the Holy Spirit, says to us, so we urge you not to receive God's work in vain, for he says, in the time of my favor I heard you, And in the day of salvation I helped you. Now is the time of God's favor. Now is the day of salvation. My son has come. He's coming again. Embrace him in repentance and faith. And all God's people said, Father God, we thank you. And we praise you. And we worship and we adore you. Your grace is so big and so rich and so beautiful. And you are so ready to pour it through Christ to anyone who turns to you. And Father, I just pray this morning that if there is anyone here who has never received that forgiveness, that you will by your Spirit stir their hearts, flood their souls, not just with repentance and confession, but with the greatest of all gifts, you yourself living in their hearts. And for all of us who know you, I pray that by your Spirit, you will open our hearts to receive your assurance and your love and to relish that mercy every single day. Hear our prayer. In the good and beautiful name of Jesus, we bring it. Amen. I invite you to stand to receive God's parting blessing, and then we're going to sing the song, King of Kings, as our closing number. If you want to raise your hands with me, please do so. Now may the God of peace, who through the blood of the eternal covenant brought back from the dead our Lord Jesus, that great shepherd of the sheep, may he equip you with everything good for doing his will, and may he work in us what is pleasing to him through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever, and all God's people said, Amen.
suffering, you saw to the other side. Knowing this was our salvation, Jesus, for our sake, you Blood and his name, in his freedom, I 